Yeah, um, interviewing Daniel Pinchbeck, he was saying that you know he sees the, the, the you know the corporations as kind of artificial life form mm -hmm. um, that we created, and, and you know we 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 tell them that they have to survive in a game called the stock exchange, mm -hmm. um, the stock market, and, and and it's you know it's just got one rule, and that one rule is basically kind of maximizing shareholder value and so on. So in a sense, we kind of created this. This monster, and we've, you know, we've encouraged that behaviour for so long. And mm. It is that old model, isn't it? That old colonial model as well. Mm. And, if that's it, and in fact, I can I can give you the legal perspective on yeah. that. Daniel Pinchbeck is correct because it's based on law. It is the law to put the interests of the shareholders first. Yeah. So if you were to sit there uh, on a board and say, you know what, I I don't feel too good about the fact that we're destroying people's livelihoods and we're driving them off their land and we're polluting the water and you know belching fumes into the atmosphere if I was the lawyer sitting that board I'd say well you know sod your conscience at, at the mm. end of the day you've got to put by law the interests of your shareholders first yeah and that's therefore to maximize profit and this is this is very important to remember I that ultimately at the end of the day conscience does not come into that equation I law has been created I actually at the behest of those companies to enable them to move forward to exponentially increase profit without consequence and since pretty much the mid 20 20th century since Rachel Carson came out around the time of uh, Silent Silent Spring, Spring. Yeah, corporations have been the ones that have financed and taken law forward. Can I just interject? Did mm. you did you not give the Rachel Carson lecture? Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, her well, an, her her celebration fiftieth anniversary. Yes. Yeah. Would you mind telling people who Rachel Carson? Yeah, was? Rachel Carson was a remarkable woman. Her her book Silent Spring. I exposed the myth and whistle blue on the use of chemicals and pesticides within industrialized agriculture. That was back in uh, the early 1960s. I, her work was um, an explosive piece of truth telling in the midst of much propaganda uh, from those corporations presenting what was meant to be seen as ultimately a green revolution to help feed the breadbasket of the world. Because she was a scientist and a poet. Yeah, very, very much. So she was coming from a scientific background on it, so she could back it up with science. Yeah. I, the the industries who were profiteering from it, of course, I, there was a huge pushback I, against her work, and indeed that pushback uh, had massive reverberations through subsequent in particular American and also ultimately UK governments with the watering down and the increasing problems in bringing forward laws to protect the environment because big corporations I took it upon themselves to ensure that those laws were either watered down, pushed back or indeed other laws that advanced the profiteering of those companies without being held to account were put first. Yeah. I, so that pushback, we are living through the consequences of that today. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that has been the normative for the second part of the 20th century and here now into the 21st century, that those that have the money get to make the laws. Certainly not so much in the international criminal law arena because that's driven by justice, which is a very different matter. But when you're looking at second tier, what's known as second tier legislation, civil litigation, ultimately at the end of the day it's what I call catch me if you can legislation, where the governments do not have to do anything. If there's some breach of some regulation, then it's down to the individual or the community that's been adversely impacted to sue the company or to sue the government, and very often civil litigation can last years, sometimes decades, it can be drawn out for a long time, it can be very, very costly, it can run to hundreds of thousands of pounds, 
and the individual the community most adversely impacted have neither the finance nor the, the legal knowledge or wherewithal to take those sorts of cases forward. That is a very different type of approach to law. Criminal law, which is what I'm dealing with at an international criminal level, is very different. That deals with justice. Uh, big business is not allowed at the table. They're not allowed to buy their way into this. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. This is not about negotiation. It's not about trade. It's about justice. And it's also about conscience. It's about recognising what it is. We have a phrase in law when malum in se is malum prohibita. When something is so wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. And international criminal law deals with the most serious crimes of concern to humanity as a whole. In the 21st century, in the 20th century, it was genocide, it was war crimes, crimes against humanity, such as apartheid. Today, in the 21st century, we're dealing with the ecocide. And you've advocated, you know, effectively the company's taking a, or your approach is taking the kind of Hippocratic oath, aren't you? So you'll say, you, you know, first you will not First harm. do no harm. First do no harm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And applying that into international criminal law. Yeah. So how does that work on a practical level? Well, that means bringing uh, prosecutions against CEOs, directors, ministers who either permit, cause or contribute to ecocide in some manner of means. And that's very important because that's about personal accountability in a criminal law and at an international level, issuing international arrest warrants so that someone can be prosecuted in other countries and brought to justice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this kind of leads on, and you hinted at it just now, uh, Polly, um, this leads on to the kind of mission life force, isn't it? Because you've now, yes. you've now given people the tools yes. to, to, to kind of fight their own campaigns locally. Not, local... quite right. oh, um, not quite right. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah. Maybe if I can yes, kind of explain. Please. So I, the campaign that we've launched is called Mission Life Force. I, this was born in part of the recognition that we know, it's very simple, we know the legal fast track to put in place ecocide law. Those countries that most require it are the small island developing states, those tiny little nations around the, the equator. I, who are most adversely impacted, who are on the front line, if you like, of climate change. Yeah. So what we want to do is bring together those who care uh, about the state of the earth uh, and who can finance putting in place a law and help those who can take that law forward, the small island developing states. We can help finance the law that they need to put in place, mm -hmm. which will help humanity and, and the earth and future generations as we go on. Right. I, this is unprecedented. It's never been done before where civil society actually helps fund the law in terms of international crime to be put in place. The document itself is not a crowdfunder. We've put it on a, a legal footing. It's, it's actually it's a trust fund. So you sign up uh, to the Earth Protectors Trust Fund and you become a trustee yeah. of that Earth Protectors Trust Fund and you find finance into that. It's a one-off, it ha doesn't have an ongoing financial obligation. Of yeah. course, you can always give in more if you wish. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea being that it's open to anyone who cares to help fund uh, those small island developing states that are at the front line that don't, don't have the finance. So that they get a seat at the table, their resource, their delegates and their lawyers can then take this into the International Criminal Court. And that's very exciting. It's very exciting. But also because it's based on an international trust fund and a document itself, the trust fund document has been legalised in virtually every jurisdiction in the world, it means then if you're on your own front line fighting whatever your ecocide is, yeah. whether or not it's fracking, pipelines in America, what have you, and you end up being treated as the criminal mm -hmm. for standing up to protect your patch of the planet, yeah. you can actually show that document in a court of law and say, this is legal evidence that I have signed up as an earth protector. I am an earth protector in law. Yeah. And that's why I'm standing up to protect and prevent that harm, that serious harm from occurring. 
and that gives a window of opportunity then to educate the judiciary, if you will, yeah. to bring evidence of what that is and to say, look, this is missing crime. It's just a matter of time and until instead of me being the criminal in this court of law, yeah. it will actually be the CEO and the directors of that company that's causing that serious that's harm. A, I think it's a brilliant initiative. I think it's, yeah. I think it's wonderful. Well, it, in fact, it's building on something that I, we know happened in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So during World War One and World War Two, we had people standing up and saying, I refuse to be complicit in the harm of war. They were called conscientious objectors. They objected to genocide. Mm. And I here we are in the 21st century, and we have conscientious protectors who are objecting to ecocide. Uh, only rather than just simply objecting, they're standing up and they're protecting. So this is very much a response to a 21st century issue, to stand up and be a conscientious protector. So what we're actually seeing now, which is very exciting, is that we have a number of activists who are now relying on this document and taking it into court. And rather like the conscientious objectors of um, the early 20th century, we're in it for the marathon. Mm -hmm. I, it's about putting this legal argument again and again and again of being conscientious protectors and saying we're not the criminals here. We may be in law right now, but further down the line, ecocide is going to be a crime and we will be seen to be standing up and whistleblowing as protectors here, conscientious protectors. And what we're looking for is that in due course, just as it was in the 20th century, we will start to have judges agreeing with this and saying, yes, this is a valid defence, a conscientious protector's defence. And when we start to get that, it sets a precedent for other activists who are standing up on their front, front line trying to protect against their ecocide. And is, and is this what you would call a sacred trust, or is that something so different? Or is that, would that be an umbrella that would... Uh... You know, I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, in a way, it is a sacred trust because it's creating a protective... Um, safeguard, a, 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 a shield, if you like, I, for for those who are on the front line of their ecocides. The, the whole idea of a sacred trust uh, is a very ancient legal tenet. And when I was researching my first book, I, I looked into this, I was researching it. I could find documentation that went back to the 16th century, but my guess is it probably goes back way before that. A certain written documentation of the sacred trust we hold uh, for our earth and that's premised on the fact that we hold moral uh, obligations and duties uniquely as this species of human beings on this earth that we hold this planet on sacred trust for future generations human and non-human so our duty is to safeguard and protect it against serious harm. And that concept of a sacred trust of humanity has been enshrined in a number of ways through documents. And indeed, the United Nations, I, in its kind of precursor, the League of Nations, it's it set out uh, the sacred trust of humanity. That actually did translate then into the United Nations Charter itself, I, under trusteeship principles, uh, Article 77, I think it is, that we hold on sacred trust, our Earth, uh, for the well-being of all inhabitants. And what's so critical here is the use of the word inhabitants, the recognition under the United Nations Charter itself that this earth isn't just uh, full of human beings, it's human and non-human that we owe that duty of care. Yeah. This really is the, the sacred duty of care to our earth, yes. to all beings. Yeah.